Um, ladies and gentlemen, as the war in Ukraine continues, the cost of reconstruction is rising. The World Bank estimated in March this year that the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine could cost upwards of 411 billion US dollars. And we know with recent events that is just continuing to rise. Today's event comes at a key time in Ukraine's recovery planning. We are days away from the 2023 Ukraine Recovery Conference here in London, at which key financial stakeholders will discuss how Ukraine's reconstruction financing will look during and after this conflict. Ukraine and its allies face significant challenges to support the country's post-conflict reconstruction. They must raise and coordinate financing while ensuring transparency and advancing anti-corruption reforms. They must attract private investors. While faced with increasingly complex sustainability reporting regulations, and in the context of heightened political, environmental, and social and economic risks, they must navigate shifting geopolitical tensions between the USA and China. Finally, for any reconstruction effort to be successful, Ukraine must be trusted to champion fair and cooperative rules for all. We should be clear that this has not necessarily been the case in the past and remains a significant challenge. Our speakers today will navigate the geopolitical risks and financial diplomacy of Ukraine's reconstruction. They will consider how much capital is needed, who will play a role, and how best to manage the geopolitical risks that will arise from the reconstruction efforts. This event is brought together by ODI's Global Risk Team, which offers geopolitical advisory to help future-proof policy and business decision-making. And I'm delighted that we have so many key speakers here with us today to discuss these pressing issues. So without further ado, it is my uh, it, huge pleasure to introduce the chair for today's panel sessions, uh, Ian Martin. Ian is the editor, publisher, and co-founder of Reaction. Ian is also an author and political columnist for The Times, former editor of The Scotsman, and former senior executive at Daily Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph. So Ian, thank you for being here today to share this session, and I will pass over to you. Thank you, Dominic, and uh, thank you, uh, Tetiana. We move to our first panel of the day. Uh, how much and who pays uh, risks and trade-offs to unlocking the capital required. And we know that the reconstruction of Ukraine is going to require a range of different actors and financing mechanisms. And all of that is going to come with its own risks. Humanitarian assistance, now that's going to play a role. Private finance is going to be needed. Um, war insurance is going to be used to mitigate the ongoing geopolitical and security risks. So what else is needed? In this first panel, we're going to explore who might provide the finance, how much capital is going to be needed, and what the resulting geopolitical and geofinancial risks are. First, you ask the question, how much uh, you know, of reconstruction? Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, not, uh, how say it, um, uh, not in the mainstream, but I will tell you we don't know. Despite the fact that uh, uh, the rapid damage assessment of the World Bank is saying 411 billion, and everybody likes to, to quote this figure because it's very nice, it's sexy, it's big, you know, is uh, because we are strong people, you know, we deal only with big figures, okay? Uh, but uh, the, 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 the truth is that while we do know a part of the damages, you know, which we can, we manage to, you know, to document, and we speak about now, Kiev School of Economics and World Bank speak about like a 145, 147 billion dollars. This is a factual assessment uh, of the territories which we control. We don't, those areas which like Mariupol and others, which we don't control, unfortunately, we cannot use the drones and heat maps, et cetera, in order to understand uh, what, what, what is there. But this is the first thing. Second, why we cannot do the assessment is uh, because the war is still, unfortunately, is ongoing. And therefore, the, the results is still in front of us. Huh? Uh, and three is uh, we don't know because uh, the reconstruction needs separately from, uh, from uh, damages and losses uh, uh, is a function of the vision. And this vision is still to be built. You know, the vision of, and this vision can be built only within Ukraine by Ukrainian elites, by Ukrainian civil society, by Ukrainian institutions. Uh, there is a process. I, I think we will hear a lot during this week about the vision like we heard uh, last year you know, during the Lugano conference. Uh, but it's, it's clear that this vision is still, uh, like it also strategic plan, is still uh, under the construction. It, it worries me a bit that we have this huge conference in London that the focus is all the private sector. And 
I don't personally I don't think the private sector is is going to do the heavy lifting of this incredibly important project right you know this is the most exciting project I think but also the most important project post 89 91 right I mean Ukraine is fighting for us for our freedoms it's it's our front line you know they're fighting for western liberal democracy they get it I think some of us didn't really get what this is about right and Ukraine has to be successful you know, we have to enable the Ukrainians to build uh, a strong economy that's self-sustaining, that can sustain their own defense and ours, right? So we can't get this wrong. And it worries me there's an over-reliance mm -hmm. on the private sector. And actually, in the end, this is a public good, right? <laughs> it's, we, we should be investing in Ukraine's defense and recovery uh, because it's in our, our interest, right? One, one final point, you know, and I've written quite a lot about it, right? You know. Uh, I think it's ridiculous, actually, to think, to, it is a public good, but I think it's ridiculous to think that Western taxpayers uh, and Western creditors, actually, who many of them are pensioners in reality, uh, should pay for Ukraine's reconstruction when we've got 400 billion bucks of frozen Russian assets in our jurisdictions. It's insane. Are we idiots? Are we absolute idiots that we let Russia, you know, well, we let Russia invade and, dis and significantly destroy Ukraine, and then we pay the bill, and... We do everything possible to defend Russian frozen assets in our jurisdictions because of issues about rule of law, which didn't seem to matter when we were taking that money in the first place, London grad, right? We didn't ask any questions. And there's, there's arguments about, obviously, the sanctity of the dollar, et cetera. Um, I would argue that's not an argument because, um, you know, Chinese money, Saudi money, money that might be vulnerable for... Uh, seizure of Russian assets or, or may get a ne negative signal about the seizure of frozen Russian assets has already left when they were frozen, <laughs> right? And, and if countries want to do genocide, want to invade countries, well, the message is clear. You'll get your assets frozen and you'll be seized. It's a good message to send. I think with China, as we all know, um, it's, it's playing a political balancing act um, but also has um, geostrategic, um, geoeconomic um, ambitions. Politically, um, the 12-point peace plan that China put out um, in February of this year was speaking to a range of audiences. Of course, it was speaking to the Ukrainians, but it's also speaking to the global south. So it's positioning itself as this sort of facilitator in the emerging world order. And then recently in May, um, just gone, we had um, Li Hui, who is the special representative for Eurasian Affairs, I mean, he visited Ukraine, Poland, France, EU headquarters, Germany, and, and then ultimately Russia. And there, when, I, when you're listening to um, Li Hui speak to the Chinese media, he's saying, look, actually, you know, this is the first delegation that China's um, sent to seek political settlement to the crisis via diplomatic means. Um, I don't think that came across so much in the Western media, but certainly when speaking, speaking to the Chinese media and to the Global South, this is the message that they're trying to get over. How that landed um, was was variable. Um, I think the polls were, you know, were quite quite dismissive, um, as were others. But here, China's really positioning itself as this facilitator and conduit for communication between the parties involved. Um, to quote Li Hui, but what was kind of China doing in in the region, kind of pre um, the Russian invasion? Um, well, from the economic perspective, it, it was playing several roles, as, as many of you will be aware. It was playing quite a substantial role um, as a lender. So actually, if we think about Chinese um, engagement with, with Russia, for example, Russia was the largest foreign debtor to Chinese state-owned banks. So it accounted for about 15% of BRI lending between 2013 and 2017. And in total, Russia had lent about... 125 billion, um, China had lent about 125 billion to the Russians. Ukraine, much, much smaller scale since 2000, um, about 7 million, um, 7 billion, sorry, and, and Belarus, uh, Belarus um, about 8 billion. But cumulatively, um, these three countries accounted for approximately about 20% of Chinese lending over the past um, two decades. Um, ultimately, I think from the Chinese perspective, and you can really see this in the Chinese media and the various um, speeches, the, the activity, economic inactivity in Ukraine is really reflecting China's core interests in energy, food security, and logistics. Well, 
I, I heard what you were saying, and I agree with the sentiments for Ukraine. I'd take every penny that was frozen and sanctioned off uh, the Russian war machine, and I would confiscate it for Ukraine. The problem with that is one of the precedent it sets, an international law. You, you can't do that. That's not how sanction regimes are designed. You take away their deterrent, which is, you're a bad person, I'm freezing your assets, and when you're good, you will get them back. It is the, it's the carrot, right, as well as the stick, to actually create behavioral change. So a lot of the international community will be reluctant. Yes, at Lugano, they'll say, yes, let's confiscate it all. But when they go back to their offices, this is what they're worried about. However, there is international precedent for how you can do this. And what it relies on is a judicial pronouncement from a competent court on liability as one and on assessment of damages. That's not that difficult to do. And the obvious method of doing that is through some justice tribunal. But the problem is that takes years to build. And the models people are looking at are all looking at liability. Right? You, you can't do that. You, you're going to have to add the capability to enable them to do an assessment of damages, because that allows you a compliant way of then taking, confiscating the sanctioned assets. The other way is to do, which is the program we're working in, which can run alongside it, is normal litigation. We've been taking billions of frozen assets for three decades. Nothing new. Taking it off terrorist groups, taking it off rogue nations, Libya, Iran. It's really easy. You go to a civil court, any competent jurisdiction, you start a case. It'll take one to three years. You get your judgment, you tack it onto the assets. Stru there's, this, there's all the statutory uh, uh, rules on this is set out in Europe, in America, Canada. It's very easy to do. It just takes the effort of organizing it, and indeed that's what we're trying to do with the Ukrainian government. Uh, in terms of capital absorption, you know, 50 billion is a, is a huge number. It's 25 percent of uh, pre-war Ukraine's GDP. You know, to put it into context again, uh, you know, on average, Ukraine FDI stood at five billion a year, uh, and uh, so 50 billion is a is a is a huge challenge, both uh, in terms of labor market. Uh, you know, where the money is gonna you know go, who is gonna help to absorb it. Uh, but uh, what I guess is uh, on a lot of minds at the moment is how productive this capital deployment would be. And, uh, and uh, in, uh, because of that, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we've been having kind of a number of discussions internally, uh, you know, where the money should go before, you know, uh, as you mentioned, I spent, uh, you know, uh, 20 years, uh, you know, covering Ukraine and Central and Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, there is always this talk about attracting FDI. And, uh, you know, my thesis uh, throughout these years hasn't changed much, uh, uh, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. Uh, the reality is that uh, Ukraine has lagged behind, uh, behind on structural reforms, and uh, uh, in, 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 in structural reforms that create business opportunities. On the macro level, the opportunity has always been there, but if you wanted to deploy a billion plus yeah, as, a, as a corporate, you would struggle to find, uh, you know, targets and sensible, productive um, uh, targets or ways to deploy capital. The point that I'm trying to make is that in, uh, in our view uh, for uh, any reconstruction to be uh, successful, uh, you know, the effort should come in parallel with the reforms which are discussed and agreed with, uh, with the Ukrainian government, because otherwise uh, there is a huge risk that uh, a lot of the reconstruction effort will become non-productive uh, capital, especially if you kind of attach, uh, you know, bureaucratic um, uh, uh, timetables and, and, uh, and, and deliverables. Panel two is managing the risks. Um, in this panel, we're going to try and answer the, the, the question, can financial diplomacy create a better risk environment to drive confidence in the reconstruction effort? But I'm sure we'll also address some, uh, some other themes as well. The aim of financial diplomacy is to build trust in Ukraine's championing of fair and cooperative rules for all. And this came up in uh, one of our final points of uh, observation and questions towards the end of panel one. In my opinion, 
once this war with Russia will be over, we'll be facing another war, a war with time. Because if we won't be in, in, in time to, to rebuild the houses, create jobs, to uh, fix all the infrastructure, we won't have the people to, to, to engage in the reconstruction. We won't have the resources, the human capital. So time is essential. And for us, in our opinion, the state should follow up, should become as quick as possible, and to do everything to provide the maximum velocity of money possible in the country. That means taking away all the barriers in regulation, and that means take away, taking away all the um, transactional costs that any business faces in Ukraine. What is a transactional cost? Corruption is a transactional cost. Slow customs is a transactional cost. Poor judge, a poor legal system is a transactional cost. So basically everything that forces you to hire an army of lawyers or an army of accountants um, is a transactional cost. Everything that takes money from you, resources from you, time from you. Now, this is the only way how we can convince other countries to consider, and other investors in the private sector in the first place, to consider Ukraine as something competitive to the already existing regimes, um, I mean economic regimes, in, in the world, like starting with Poland, ending up with Ukraine. We should offer them a very different vision. And uh, this is something I, I think that we're being developing right now, but it doesn't touch upon only specific sectors where we expect the investors to come in. It touches upon like fundamental reimagining of how the country should function. Many international players have come to Ukraine during that year. And we already see players like BlackRock, JP Morgan, other international significant players taking that ball into their hands. We want to see real action though. So establishment of Ukrainian Development Fund that would be realized quicker, hopefully not uh, after the war as today we have read in Financial Times. So this should happen uh, quicker than that. And we also need to look not only at big transactions like infrastructure, but also at SMEs, uh, support for SMEs. And support for SMEs not only for those that are present in Ukraine, but for those that are in Slovakia and uh, they uh, should enter Ukraine. Only during uh, 2022, the biggest, big, biggest international brands like Bayer, Unilever, Nestle, Kingspan, they announced new investment projects in Ukraine. Companies like Cerzanit, they already invested in Ukraine during the war, and they have built new facility to produce um, tiles in Ukraine. So this is happening, and we need to show example to the world. And do not be afraid to work with Ukraine. Just talk to, talk to government, talk to parliamentarians, talk to relevant authorities. We are there to support you because we need to support us and develop our country. The research shows that basically after a war of this nature, there will be a lingering period of, of uncertainty where investors will, will want to test the, whether the peace or any kind of peace is durable, even in the best case scenario. And so there will be a need to in establish instruments uh, that would help accelerate it. So basically de-risk some of these tail risks from the investor point of view. We are now liaising with the European Union and with a donor number of donor countries to set up a small fund. We think of it as a pilot, although it might grow over time, and we call it Ukraine Recovery Guarantee Facility to help um, uh, start restart reinsurance market for war risk in Ukraine, focusing initially on uh, transportation and logistics, because even many logistics companies are afraid to send their trucks, their cargo trains into Ukraine because they're afraid that they, they will be lost there due to military action. And so we are working uh, in, on parallel tracks, at least on three tracks. One, uh, one is internal uh, to develop this facility as a concept. Second, with donors to make sure that we um, uh, can have the resources with the European Union and bilateral donors. Some of them uh, are going to offer probably meaningful, not very big, but meaningful grants to help launch it. We're also in the process of working with operators, so actors in the insurance market, to identify administrative mechanism for this. Um, relaunching this war insurance. And we're also uh, working with uh, partner institutions like MIGA, 
DFC and bilateral agencies to make sure we are additional and complementary? I think it's probably true to say, but I know it's true to say, that if you speak to donors, um, I, I, and I can't speak about uh, public sector donors, but the private sector donors, almost top of their list is concerns about corruption, where the money's going to go, governance, etc. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a huge concern. Um, it's also something which has popped up. I would say almost every panelist, both this one and the previous one, has mentioned it. I, I can think of one exception, uh, I think, but either directly or indirectly. So, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really important part of building back better. <clears throat> and it's also part, I think, of a partnership. The partnership, we know what good governance looks like. We know what uh, good legal frameworks look like. Um, we have examples. We have them right here. We have, in this country, a very strong legislative uh, procedures and a very strong uh, judicial procedures. Now, the great thing about these is that they can be exported. The common law is like a reserve currency. It actually delivers a, um, a benefit which can uh, encapsulate um, real uh, international uh, currency, if you like. And if we, talk, if we look at some of the, the numbers that we're talking about in terms of reconstruction, um, even the numbers that are banded about today, in terms of both stock and expected flow of cash, what we're really looking at is something that's very akin to a large financial center. Very, not, not a small financial center, a, a medium to large financial center. Now, to, to look at the, that kind of monetary flow, you, get, you really need to have a governance structure and a contractual obligation, a litigation um, apparatus, restitution, uh, ev everything that goes with uh, um, a legal framework. I mean, the United States has provided sort of between 75 and 100 million, sorry, billion dollars in, in military aid um, so far since the beginning of the war. And the Pentagon has got roughly $3 billion left before they run out of money and will need to go back to Congress and ask for more money. Um, and so the question is, will Congress support additional funds? And you'll remember that Donald, sorry, Joe Biden and Kevin McCarthy negotiated a cap on next year's spending levels. That cap does not include space for additional aid for Ukraine. So the fact that the Pentagon's going to run out of money in September and there's no space in the agreement between the White House and Congress on increasing aid for Ukraine means this is really going to come to a head. Now, there are many, many senior leadership, especially among senior leadership in the Senate and in the House, who are very supportive of Ukraine and increase, they, they recognize the threat that Russia poses and they want to continue to provide assistance to Ukraine. This is Republicans and Democrats. Um, but the House Freedom Caucus, which is now sort of controlling in some ways Kevin McCarthy's ability to introduce legislation in the House, does not want to spend more money on Ukraine. Even though the U.S. private sector, I think, will clearly be involved to, to a very large extent in rebuilding Ukraine, there are some lesser known U.S. government agencies that I think will be involved too and are a resource for private sector firms looking to get involved in Ukraine. And that includes the Exim Bank, which um, does finances the sales of exports, U.S. exports, um, especially where there's political or co commercial risk. The U.S. Trade and Development Agency, which promotes private sector involvement in development projects around the world. The U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, which provides loans and guarantees and political risk insurance globally. And finally, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which provides outright grants to countries for, for large development projects. So I think as we look at, you know, we sort of have the U.S. government support and the military support, and then the U.S. private sector support, sort of between those two, there is this category of small U.S. government agencies that have resources and expertise to help in, in the reconstruction. I was doing some work yesterday and I came across this quote from a Bloomberg interview just after Brexit with Vladimir Putin. And he said, Britain is leaving and has de facto left the European, European Union. However, it is not withdrawn from its special relationship with the United States. And I believe that the UK's relations with Russia 
depends upon Britain's special relationship with the United States rather than its own presence in or absence from the European Union. I thought that was very curious, actually, and I wonder what your reaction actually is, Lou. So I think to that point, I mean, Putin was right. I mean, the, the, United, the UK's relationship is, is, in many global issues, is being defined through its relationship, special relationship with the United States. How all this is landing in the global south, um, because actually um, both um, China and Russia have been very effective um, at landing messages um, about the war, but it's, it's part of a bigger picture. And we talked about sanctions earlier in the, in the case of Russia. I mean, China is really watching closely um, how all of this is playing out, um, thinking about how to um, navigate um, sanc possible sanctions, um, and as it developing its own legislation. So we talked a lot about um, the use of, like Merit, you mentioned common law as a, as a reserve currency, but China also investing a lot in a whole range of countries in terms of um, developing um, training for judiciary, for police, um, et cetera, the full picture. But also I just wanted to make a note of another very important election coming up in 2024, and that is in Taiwan. Um, and that will also have significant um, impact, I would argue, in terms of US-China relations, um, China-Russian relations, and of course, um, what happens in Taiwan could make um, Ukraine look, I don't want to use the word insignificant, but it could make it look very small in, in comparison. I find three asks, and I'll put it to you, can you do it? The first is the presumption that Europe is committed to Ukraine. I don't think that's coming through very well. And I don't think that's coming through very well because the first obvious question you'll ask is, what is the first step before we talk about reconstruction? The war must end. Note, I didn't say Ukraine must win the war. That would be optimal, but the war must end. Is everything being done to make sure the war ends? You know, and Keynes said in the same book that war does involve some amount of suffering and sacrifice. That's a trade-off. It doesn't appear, I think, at this time, and this needs to change, that the West is willing to make that trade-off in substantial measure. And the impression I got from this conversation also was that the US is being asked to do a lot of heavy lifting in a European war, which they must, might have done the Second World War, but the narrative that links US prosperity to Ukraine's prosperity is conspicuously absent, unlike in the Marshall Plan. So I think the geopolitics of finance links to can Europe do it? And if it can, then Europe can afford it. Uh, the second uh, adage that comes out of this, and I think Rebecca referred to this, is I can say this to you as an Indian. You know, play ball with as many big powers as you can. The narrative that Europe is part, Ukraine is part of Europe is a nice narrative, but if it's not working, then I think playing ball with China is a good idea. Bringing Japan to the conversation is a good idea, and as you rightly said, uh, you know, in your political, uh, engaging with Africa is a very, very good idea, just to hedge your bets and, and increase multidimensionality. The final point I would make is that uh, I think what I, the sense I got from this conversation is that what Ukraine needs to do, and this is very difficult, in a region from Turkey, I don't look at it as part of just the Soviet Union, to Iran, to Russia, is to become best in class at being a good European country in terms of lack of nepotism, at least come down to Italian-style levels of nepotism at least come down to you know, uh, UK-style levels of fiscal management, which are not great at this time. But that's, that, that transition is important, and it should surely come as part of an EU accession process. So there's a deal to be done there somewhere, where a new accession process should lead to, your, to Ukraine being supported to make big changes which it is otherwise not able to make.